Welcome to the third lecture in the Henry VII series. Today we are going to look at the following question. How did Henry VII deal with dynastic threats from the Yorkists? We are going to examine four dynastic threats that cover the breadth of Henry's reign and examine how he used a different approach to deal with each threat. The term dynastic threat relates specifically to those who look to depose Henry and place a Yorkist upon the throne. This should not be confused with popular rebellions, which is when the common people petition the king for a tax relief. These will be explored in the next lecture. Dynastic threats manifest less as rebellions, but rather as plots and schemes that often involve puppeteers who are playing a game to become the next kingmaker. Today's lecture will be split into five sections. The first section will provide an overview of the key players in this game for the English throne. We will then examine the first threat that Henry faced. This came from two Yorkists, Viscount Lovell and Sir Humphrey Stafford. We will then examine the Lambert Simnel pretender threat and how this accumulated in the Battle of Stoke. We will then look at the elongated threat Henry faced from the pretender pack in Warbeck and how he had to use his foreign policy to overcome this threat. Finally, we will examine the perceived threat from the Yorkist nobleman, the Duke of Suffolk, and how Henry's tactics changed in the final decade of his reign. Let's first look at pretenders. Like the word suggests, a pretender was someone who pretended to be a Yorkist claimant. There were two pretenders, Lambert Simnel and Perkin Warbeck. Remember this was a time before photography and video. So the only image of these claimants was hand-drawn or painted. Unless seen regularly in public, very few common people would know how they appeared. Plus these boys were growing up and their appearance will naturally change through puberty. It was also not a foregone conclusion that the princes had been killed at the hands of their uncle. Many Yorkist supporters believed they were still imprisoned in the tower, and there were rumours that during Richard's turbulent reign they'd been able to escape incarceration and reach the continent. Therefore, these pretenders were credible threats, especially Perkin Warbeck, who continued to undermine Henry's international reputation throughout the 1490s. There were three viable claimants that someone could pretend to be. Edward V, the elder of the two princes in the tower. Richard of York, his younger brother. And their cousin Edward the Earl of Warwick. Edward V was not an ideal candidate as by 1485. He would already in his mid-teens and had briefly been king so his face was better known in London. So the two pretender threats focused on the younger prince, Richard, who, if still alive, would just be reaching puberty at the start of Henry's reign. His appearance could have changed from boyhood. His cousin the Earl of Warwick was of a similar age so could therefore be easily impersonated, however the real Earl of Warwick was imprisoned in the tower. Secondly, Henry faced dynastic threats from Yorkist nobles who still lived in England. These nobles did not necessarily have Plantagenet blood, but they had risen to power under the reign of Edward IV since they'd supported him against Henry VI. Today we will examine the threat from Viscount Lovell and Humphrey Stafford. We then have those who have a legitimate claim to the throne due to their Plantagenet blood. This threat came from the nephews of Edward IV, John and Edmund de la Pole. They each pose a threat at different points during Henry's reign. Behind the scenes, but often at the nucleus of plots and conspiracies was Margaret of York. She was the sister to Edward IV and the Dowager Duchess of Burgundy as the widow to Charles the Bold. She had no children but a step-grandson who would become Philip of Burgundy. Her court became the center of Yorkist conspiracy and she is widely considered the mastermind behind the two pretender threats. It is for this reason that I often call her Maleficent, she acted like a malevolent figure, banished from her homeland, who acted as a thorn in Henry's side. The Lovell and Stafford uprising is one that students easily forget about because it was so short-lived. However, 
There are two reasons why this was a critical early victory for Henry. Firstly, due to the timing. The rising took place in May 1486, less than a year after the Battle of Bosworth. Secondly, due to Henry's location, as he was in Yorkshire at the time of the uprising. Lovell and Humphrey Stafford had sought sanctuary at Colchester Abbey. This meant Henry could not arrest them as traitors to the realm. However, while Henry was up in the north, they left sanctuary and tried to stage an uprising in Worcester. This failed because Henry had already established a support base there. Henry was in York on progress during this critical point, but he made use of his extensive spy network and so was able to foil the plot before it got off the ground. However, if it had escalated, then the Yorkist supporters could have risen up against him in the city of York. Following the failed uprising, Lovell managed to flee into exile. He went to the court of Burgundy and would reappear during the Battle of Stoke. The eldest Stafford brother, Humphrey, was executed, but Thomas Stafford, his younger brother was spared. This is an example of calculated mercy on Henry's part. He executed the eldest son to shame the family into submission but he kept the younger brother alive so that the family could rebuild their reputation by paying him loyal service. Next, Henry faced the Lambert Simnel pretender threat. Simnel was from humble and largely unknown origins. He was picked up by an exiled Yorkist priest called Richard Simmond as the priest noticed that he was particularly handsome for a ten-year-old boy and was of keen intelligence. He cheated him in the manners of the Yorkist royal court. He recruited the support of John de la Pole, the Earl of Lincoln, who had been Richard III's heir presumptive before Bosworth. At the time, a rumour spread across the continent that Edward Earl of Warwick had escaped imprisonment from the Tower of London, so it was decided that this was who Simnel should pretend to be. Once ready, the Earl of Lincoln transported Simnel to Ireland where he gained the support of the Earl of Kildare. Ireland's most powerful nobleman. He was actually crowned in Dublin as Edward VI of England. Henry VII dealt with this threat in a simple way. He took the Earl of Warwick out of the tower and he paraded him along the streets of London to prove that he was still alive and that Simnel was a pretender. However, the Earl of Lincoln was not ready to give up the fight. He travelled to the court of Margaret of Burgundy who pledged 2,000 mercenaries to his cause. Henry's actions did not prevent the Earl of Lincoln from landing an army to stake Simnel's claim to the throne. The Earl of Kildare also pledged 6,000 soldiers, so the invading army numbered 8,000 strong. The army landed in the north of England then marched to East Stoke in Nottinghamshire, where he gained support, including Viscount Lovell. There. They pitched battle against a Tudor army of 12,000 soldiers. The Tudor army was not only larger but it had more experienced commanders in Henry's uncle Jasper Tudor and John de Vere, the Earl of Oxford. The Battle of Stoke was a resounding success for Henry VII. The Earl of Lincoln was killed in battle alongside 4,000 soldiers. Viscount Lovell disappeared, some believe he died in the battle. But myths circulated that he was hiding as an outlaw in caves. Regardless, he was never seen alive again. Historians consider it the final battle of the War of the Roses and, from this point onwards, Henry presided over a country of peace. Henry dealt with the threat using the same calculated mercy tactic as before. He imprisoned Richard Simmond the priest who had sparked the plot but spared the priest who had delivered the sermon at Simnel's false coronation in Ireland. He then used his spy network to discover other influential co-conspirators, a few of whom were executed but most were given fines as a financial penalty. As for young Lambert Simnel, Henry recognised his innocence as a pawn in this plot. He gave him a job as the spit boy in the royal kitchens. There, Simnel remained and worked hard, until he rose up the ranks enough to become the royal falconer, a respectable position for a boy of shady origins. The next threat spanned for nine years in the 1490s. Perkin Warbeck was Flemish and from humble origin but played a much more active role as a pretender than Lambert Simnel had. He arrived at the court of Burgundy in 1490 with a story. Apparently, 
He was Richard Duke of York and an unknown murderer had conveniently murdered his older brother Edward. He was apparently spared due to his age. He had been living under the protection of an exiled Yorkist called Sir Brampton, who had told him to keep his identity a secret. But Brampton had recently returned to England and so he had travelled to Burgundy to seek the protection and sponsorship of his aunt. Historians debate whether Margaret believed Warbeck's story, or whether she knew he was a fraud but supported him as the best chance for a Yorkist return to power. Regardless, she proclaimed him as Richard of York, the younger of the two brothers, and even minted coins under his name. She educated Warbeck in the manners and customs of the English court and she gave Warbeck safe haven when he was evicted from other courts. In response, Henry wrote to Margaret's step-grandson, Philip of Burgundy, to ask him to denounce Warbeck. When Philip refused, Henry imposed a trade embargo on Burgundy, which was deeply unpopular with both Flemish and English merchants. It lasted for three years between 1493 and 1496 and shows how Henry was willing to sacrifice international trade to rid himself of this security threat. We are now going to examine the movements of Perkin Warbeck across Northern Europe to understand how he garnered support of international leaders and undermined Henry's legitimacy on the international stage. He first travelled to Cork in Ireland in 1491 where he hoped to receive the same level of support as Lambert Simnel. However, that support did not materialise, so he travelled to Burgundy. He then arrived to the French court in 1492. At this point, Henry VII had signed the Treaty of Redden with Brittany to help defend their independence. Therefore, he was technically at war with France. As a result, Charles VIII received Warbeck to his court and recognised him as Richard Duke of York. It's doubtful that Charles genuinely believed Warbeck's story, but by inviting him to court, it placed pressure on Henry to withdraw his troops from Brittany. This, Henry did, but on favourable terms. He negotiated the Peace of Etapla in 1492, which is something we will explore in greater depth in a future lecture. As part of it, Warbeck was forced to leave the court of France and Charles VIII agreed to no longer support any pretenders or claimants to the English throne. Warbeck returned to Burgundy. In 1493, he attended the funeral of Frederick III of the Holy Roman Empire as Richard IV of England. He gained full support from the new emperor, Maximilian I. He then attempted his first landing in England off the south coast of Kent in a town called Deal. However, his army faced heavy resistance, and Warbeck did not even disembark the ship. He fled to Ireland where he gained the support of only one Irish earl and tried to lay siege to Waterford, before facing heavy resistance. At this point, Henry remarked of the Irish, I suppose they will crown an ape, next. Warbeck then travelled to Scotland and gained the support of James IV. He offered a noblewoman called Catherine Gordon in marriage. Warbeck married her in 1495 in Edinburgh, which was celebrated with a tournament. The following year, James IV then prepared to invade England in support of Warbeck's claim to the throne. A red, gold and silver banner was prepared for Warbeck as the rightful King Richard IV. They invaded England, but only made it four miles south of the border, before meeting a high level of resistance and retreating again. James IV had hoped the people of Northumberland would rally to Warbeck's cause, but they did not. Henry then sued for peace with James IV. This was achieved with the Peace of Aiton in 1497, where James IV agreed to marry Henry's daughter Margaret. This was a clever diplomatic move by Henry. By offering his daughter to the Scottish king in marriage, he was giving James IV enough of an incentive to retreat and abandon Warbeck's cause. By the time Warbeck fled Scotland, he had two ships and only about 120 soldiers to fight his cause. 
he tried to lay siege to Waterford again, before sailing south to attempt a second invasion of England. This time he chose Cornwall because a rebellion had erupted their overpayment of tax, ironically so to pay for Henry's defence of the Anglo-Scottish border. He hoped to capitalise on their discontent. He promised the rebels that if they supported him as a king, he would put an end to the tax. The rebels recognised him as King Richard IV on Bodmin Moor, and he led an army of 6,000 men to lay siege to Exeter. However, when he heard that the royal army had arrived, he tried to flee again. He was finally captured in Hampshire in October 1497. Henry used calculated mercy when first receiving Warbeck as a prisoner. He was kept incarcerated in the Tower of London for two years. However, in 1499, he persuaded the Earl of Warwick to attempt a breakout. They were both caught trying to escape and this time Henry executed them both. Though Warbeck failed to gain any substantial support, it did nonetheless have a profound impact on Henry VII's government. This is because Henry's Lord Chamberlain and step-uncle, Sir William Stanley, chose to support Warbeck's claim. As Lord Chamberlain, William Stanley was essentially the gatekeeper for the king's privy chamber and so controlled access to the king. His betrayal was personal and it led to Henry becoming increasingly paranoid about who to trust, which would have a negative impact on court politics in the latter half of his reign. Not only this, but Henry's mother Margaret Beaufort and his stepfather Lord Thomas Stanley put pressure on Henry to show mercy to Sir William as a member of the family. This, Henry refused to do, and William Stanley was executed in 1495. By 1500, Henry was in a secure position. He had used military might international diplomacy and his spy network to good effect and therefore overcome the Yorkist threat. There was only one remaining claimant in England, Edmund de la Pole. His older brother, the Earl of Lincoln, had pitched battle against Henry in 1487 at Stoke so Henry had never fully trusted the de la Pole family since. But Edmund had proven loyalty to Henry and in 1492 had earned back his ancestral title of Duke of Suffolk. In 1501, Edmund de la Pole left the country without royal permission, so effectively made himself an exile. He arrived at the court of Maximilian I where he was referred to as the White Rose. Henry perceived this as rebellion against the crown and so used an act of attainder to declare Edmund de la Pole as a traitor. He then negotiated a treaty with Maximilian in 1505 where, in exchange for a payment of £10,000, he agreed to not support any known English rebels. Edmund de la Pole was then captured and kept essentially as a prisoner to the Holy Roman Emperor. Then in 1506, Philip of Burgundy was sailing to Spain when he became shipwrecked off the English coast. He was forced to take shelter at the English court and plea with Henry for support in repairing his ship. Henry drove a hard bargain, which accumulated in the Treaty of Windsor. As part of this, Henry insisted that Edmund de la Pole be extradited back to England. Philip agreed to broker the negotiation with Maximilian I, and as a result, de la Pole was forcibly returned to England. The case of Edmund de la Pole the Duke of Suffolk shows how Henry's paranoia grew with age. There were a number of reasons for this, but one of the key turning points was 1503 when both his eldest son Arthur and his wife Elizabeth of York died. At this point, Henry lost some of the dynastic security that he had spent the previous 15 years building. This resulted in him perceiving Suffolk as a greater threat than he perhaps was in reality. Suffolk did not raise an army against Henry. Yes, he visited the court of Maximilian, who had associations with Margaret of Burgundy and had previously supported Warbeck. But there were no moves made by any of the international players against Henry at this point. The case of the Duke of Suffolk has been used by some historians to stake the claim that Henry was an overly punitive king, who was paranoid of threats. In some ways, his actions against Suffolk undermines the calculated mercy that he had used on previous occasions to both punish those who needed it and to give second chances to others. <laughs>
Thank you for listening to this lecture. You have had to digest a large amount of information, and some of it is a narrative of important events. Therefore, it is important that you spend some time planning out how you would approach an answer to this question. You will not have time in an exam to address all four threats discussed in this lecture. However, you can draw parallels and comparisons between events. My recommendation would be to focus in on two events in depth and make reference to others. Ensure you cover a good period of time to show an understanding of how the threat changed throughout Henry's reign. You can also link these events to overarching themes, like the importance of diplomatic relations to prevent conspiracies overseas. Tune into my next lecture to learn how Henry dealt with the two popular rebellions of his reign.